So welcome everybody to this next uh, Impact From Home interview. I am super excited to have Shannon with us today to talk about uh, everything involved in careers in sustainability. And um, a little bit of a preview of things to come. So Shannon and I are going to have a chat for around, I would say about 45 minutes, but we really want it to be more of a conversation. So if you have any questions along the way, pop them into the chat box. Um, you could even unmute yourself and uh, we can really have a, a chat together. At the end, there is going to be a bit of a sneak preview about a Net Impact Amsterdam uh, mentoring program that we are starting. So please stay tuned to the end and I'll tell you a little bit about that. So I'm going to get started by giving a bit of introduction into who Shannon is and what brought her here today. So Shannon has mentored and trained over 800 professionals and master graduates over 3000 hours to maximize their personal brands to advance their impact careers. She chose sustainability career coaching to combine her diverse experience as a hiring manager, a business coach, and a CR consultant for Adobe, Deloitte, Barclays Global Investors, and WWF after having started her career 20 years ago in corporate recruiting. As an ICF certified coach and an accredited in the Game Changer Index, I'm gonna to have to ask you, Shannon, what that's about. Shannon leverages NLP and mindfulness when helping career changers break through personal barriers. She's been featured in the Huffington Post, The Guardian, Green Biz, Triple Pundit and CSR Wire and speaks regularly at international conferences, including the Caring Hitachi Business for Social Responsibility and Net Impact. She speaks French and Spanish, having lived and worked in the Alps and Patagonia and earned her MBA from Thunderbird in Arizona and Geneva. So thank you, Shannon. Welcome to Net Impact Amsterdam today. Thank you for having me. It's great, great to be a part of, of Net Impact again. I've been working with Net Impact for 20 years. So it's one of my um, charities of choice, so to speak, and networks of choice. So it's great to be here. Great. So I thought we would change things up a bit from the start. And because um, careers is such a broad topic and we really wanna make sure that we cover topics and subjects that are super interesting to you, I have a couple poll questions that I'm going to ask to see where you are in your career or what exactly you're interested in. And this can kind of help us shape the questions we're going to be asking. So I'm going to launch the poll now. There's two questions. The first is, um, kind of which of the following statements best describes you if you're a recent graduate looking to transition careers or maybe currently working in sustainability and looking to advance your career. And then secondly is more about kind of what your biggest challenge or roadblock is uh, in your careers at the moment. And once people have answered a few of the questions, I can kind of present the results and uh, then we kind of take a deep dive from there. And I do love a good poll. So thank you for <laughs> humoring me and participating in this. So we seem to have quite a few people looking to transition into a career in sustainability. It seems to be at the moment about at the top and a few recent graduates and a few people just looking to advance their career in sustainability. And give you a couple more seconds. Okay, let me post this so hopefully everyone can see it. So most people looking to transition into sustainability career. So that's super interesting. So I think a lot of the topics we can cover today can be around how to kind of leverage your current skill set to this kind of new career path. And then in terms of roadblocks, uh, quite a range. So knowing what types of jobs best suit your qualifications, finding uh, job openings, and then translating your experience through to your resume, LinkedIn, or a job interview. So thank you, that's super helpful. So 
So maybe Shannon, based on that, we can kind of jump right in to these kind of roadblocks that we're seeing. And um, from your perspective and working with the clients that you have, what do you find is the biggest challenge when it comes to translating experiences uh, into a resume or LinkedIn or an interview from someone who's transitioning from an alternative career into sustainability? Mm. That's a great question because it's kind of the, it's we don't know what we don't know. And I think that's the hardest piece for, for most career changers is, you know, what should I be doing when? What are the best strategies? How do I translate my skills? How do I tell my story so that it really resonates? Um, there's so many kind of questions that come up when we do a career change. Um, I'd like to probably frame this with a little bit of positivity and um, a sense of opportunity in that uh, over the 12 years I've been working in, in career coaching in this space specifically, I've been 20 years in the sustainability world or impact world because it's not just sustainability. So I'll probably use the word impact today because I think it's a bit broader and I do work in social impact, international development, et cetera. So, um, and across all the different, you know, routes that you could take into a career that makes a difference um, or an impact career. The challenge is always the fact that it's all constantly evolving, right? We are constantly seeing a change in language, a change, every company looks at it differently. Every organization looks at this a little differently, prioritizes it a little differently. So one thing I always say is make sure you target a sector or two, get really focused in, which is challenging because we want to, our natural tendency is to cast our net really wide, right? So we have as many opportunities as possible, but actually the reverse is what works. So the more focused you can get, the more you're going to resonate for that audience. And that means once you've targeted and know what your target audience is for your marketing, this is really a marketing exercise at the end of the day, so that your marketing tools and your approach and your language all match that audience. So the semantics piece can easily be overcome if you do your homework about your market and then try to match those semantics. So I think that's one of the big challenges is that it's constantly changing. We try to cast our net too, too wide and do ourselves a disservice as career changers trying to open up too many opportunities and then not resonating for any one track. Matching semantics, not just using language like sustainability, because for those of us that are in this world, the word sustainability actually means nothing now. Um, it's too generic, it's too vague. Um, we wanna know okay, are you doing renewables? Are you doing waste? Are you doing human rights? Like, what are you actually putting your stake in the ground around? Um, so just be careful. We need some of those keywords in our personal branding messaging because they need to still come up, you know, from SEO and, you know, search engine options and optimization, things like that in terms of our, our LinkedIn profiles. However, we also want to be drilling down again and getting quite specific underneath that quickly. So I'd say those are kind of a few tips, but with the challenges, um, I think another piece which we might be talking about a little later is around, um, and what you all were saying around, you were looking for how do I find a job, um, is that we default as job seekers, we default, we want a new job, so we default immediately into redo my resume or CV, get on job boards. And that's our, like, our auto play of this process and that is not what we want to do. So I think it's also about re-envisioning our process of how we're going to approach a job change or career change strategically. And that's what my 13 step course does. I built that from the candidate's perspective, but with the lens of a recruiter. And funny enough, of the 13 steps, we don't even start to work on the resume until step eight, uh, eight of the 13 which means we're doing all that other pre-work around who is my audience, what am I offering, how do I match the semantics and all of that kind of foundational work before. Um, so I think that's just a few tips there. I'll, I'll pause because I know we're gonna have other questions where other bits of advice will come out. Um, but I think the other thing to think about before we move on is just what I call the hidden jobs market. And we can talk about that a little bit more as well if you're interested. 
Yeah, I love that. And I, I love that you mentioned uh, process and, and casting your net widely, because I think I think it's a real challenge for people transitioning to know what would be of interest to them, because there are so many um, interesting facets of sustainability, like you said, from renewables to circular economy and like everything in between, they can all uh, appeal to us in different ways. And I think a fear, I know a fear that I felt was, well, what if I go down this rabbit hole of, you know, renewable energy, and then it ends up, well, that wasn't exactly what I wanted at the end of the day. Um, so do you have mm. any tips in terms of the how to narrow it down, but narrow it down in a way that, um, yeah, a, a, at the end of the day, will align to our values and, and our passion and um, will not end up making its backtrack later on. Yeah, I think there's two points in response to that, Kathy. Is, um, one is, even if you go down one route, you can still change. So don't put too much pressure on yourselves that because you've chosen renewables or you've chosen a certain sector now, that it's not still going to serve you in that career journey story that you're building, right? Um, and so I think it's important not to think that you have to have the final answer and stay on that track the whole way. Because in the sustainability impact space, we are all constantly evolving with this. And so it's a very fluid space. It's not like an accountant or a lawyer or a teacher where we kind of are fast tracked and we have our education and everything's all planned out for us. I mean, even that, even those tracks are not always that planned out anymore. It's a very fluid, um, you know, jobs market and career kind of reality now. So I think don't, don't put too much pressure on yourselves to have a final answer, but do try to get focused for this next step, if that makes sense. And that next step, um, might need to be an interim step, meaning you might not be able to jump right into the dream job that you think you want because you have some gaps. That's okay. Just make sure the interim step that you're doing next is going to be helping you to fill some of those gaps to get you where you ultimately think you want to be. And how do you figure out then where you want to be, which is the next piece of the question, which um, for me, it's all about mapping your criteria. So what we normally do is go, I just want a job that makes a difference. I just want to have you know, the word sustainability in my title. I don't really care where I work. I could do NGO. I could work in the government. I could work in corporates. I just want to make a difference. I want a job that gives me purpose, right? Well, all of that is going to just be swarming around in your mind and not, again, getting detailed enough or specific enough. So the more you can map your specific interests, passions, um, what are you reading about? What gets you excited when you start to think, I want to make a difference on that issue? Or what kinds of products and services do you care about? Are you loyal to as a consumer? Um, it's lots of those kind of, it's almost mapping really you actually ultimately. And we start with that in my course because we need to know what is that driver behind all this for you, right? What gets you out of bed in the morning? What is that passion point? What are you willing to fight for? And once we map all that out on what I call the dream job targeting map, which actually breaks down your criteria into a few key sections, which I'll explain in a minute, um, allows you to then have a one page kind of map, road map, or um, like almost like a I call it almost like a litmus test as you go out to the market. You've got something tangible that you've already thought through regardless of the market and said, this is what I want. If I can get everything I really want. Now, you're not going to get everything. So some of those things are essential criteria and some might be desired criteria of what you think you want next. And then the rest of it maybe is more unknown and you're going to discover it as you evolve in your career. And that's okay as well. But I think all of us have a bit of, a, of a, a criteria list, but we just don't actually write it down and use it when we go out shopping for the next role. So things I encourage you to think about as you build your criteria list are sector. So do you want to work nonprofit, for-profit, government, academia? If you want for-profit, do you want consulting or do you want in-house? 
what sector or industry interests you the most that you've maybe worked in or had some sort of interaction with in education or other paths within your life that you can build a little bit of a story around understanding their stakeholders or their business or their operations. And then thinking about those impact issues that are getting you really excited, right? Is it plastics? Is it human rights? You know, what is it that you feel you could actually really make a difference in and have a scalable impact over time because you drilled down on that one or two, those one or two issues. So those are kind of the ways I would break down your criteria around the market. And then you would break down your criteria about what matters to you personally. What kind of salary do you need to make? Where's the location? What kind of commute? What kind of hours? What kind of team? Who's your leadership going to be? Um, you know, dream it up. Really let yourself free flow this and visualize what this possibility could be before you go out and try to start then narrowing it down in the market. Because what happens is once we go out to the job boards, we're going to get overwhelmed and we're going to be like, Ooh, that looks good. It's like a kid in a candy shop, right? Ooh, that looks good. I could do that. Or that could be interesting. And that's when we end up potentially picking the wrong, as you were saying, Kathy rabbit hole, right? Because we haven't done the groundwork first around identifying what our key criteria are going to be. Leave it there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's great. And I think for me, what, what's also helpful if this kind of choosing what we want seems a bit daunting is to even start making a list of what you know you don't like. <laughs> Sometimes going with the opposite can also be super helpful. And uh, to find a space, like all of these amazing brainstorming tips that Shannon is, is giving you, find a space for you to think without judgment, uh, I think is really yeah. important because often it's the first thing that pops into our head is the thing that we're most passionate about. And then once we start overthinking it, um, it can be when we start to feel a bit, a bit stuck. That's uh, so a great think... way to say it, Kathy, too. And I think it's the inputs that we're getting externally that get us confused. So again, start mm -hmm. with that inner piece and then we'll go out to the market rather than letting the market kind of push us in one direction or another. Um, the other thing I just wanted to note, that was a really good point, Kathy, around what do you not want to do? So in my dream job targeting tool, I have three columns. The first column is no. So it's everything you've done in the past that you don't want to do again. Because oftentimes when we make a career change, what happens is we don't know how to downplay some of the things we've done in the past that we don't want to do again. And it, we end up then getting pigeonholed into that again. So I was an accountant, of all things, in my previous career. Um, and I didn't really want to do accounting again. So I put accounting in my no column, but in my yes column was data analysis. I still wanted to use that analytical skill to go and help write CSR reports and capture data in order to report on corporate responsibility. So I translated that, but said, I'm not going to use the language accounting because that's not going to be relevant to my new audience. I'm going to translate that into my yes column as the language that's going to resonate, even though the skill sets vary almost the same. And then I have a please column, which is what are the what are the things I want to be growing into, but I have no experience in at all. So those could be more the dream in the please column, but it's where we want to be having the next interim step or the next rule really helping position you to get there eventually. So that's just a really good point. I think we have to be able to park the stuff we know is a no, a no go. So when we see those opportunities cross our, you know, our email or whatever, we just say, mm, nope, I've already said no to that. Don't get distracted. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Uh, I see a couple of questions in the chat box before I jump into those, because this might segue into it. Uh, I'm wondering, Shannon, if you can give us your thoughts on kind of trends in impact careers, if you're seeing kind of particular uh, positions or just in general, the availability of positions and, and how that's kind of been changing over time since you've started in, in this field. Wow. Well, there's kind of two layers to that question. I think a lot of people are worried about what it's looking like now in the COVID era. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if that's maybe a little bit more important than how it's changed over the 20 years I've been in the space. I mean, even 10 years ago, five years ago, this was not on the, this was still an upward battle for us trying to get the buy-in from organizations. 
So I think the biggest shift um, is around ESG and the fact that we have, you know, Larry Fink from BlackRock coming out and saying, this matters now. It matters from a financial market. It matters for investors. It matters for private equity. So we've now got a momentum, a buy-in, a business case for environmental social governance in our financial markets. And that is the biggest shift we, we've been working towards up for 20 years. And that is the biggest shift we've seen this year. And that is going to be, uh, that's going to, what that means then is that we're on this wave now that we're not going to go back. We're not going to go, we're not going to go back now because the markets get it. They understand that this matters. Investors understand that this matters and that they can get the returns they want while also being responsible. So that's the biggest one. I think ESG is now also becoming, back to my semantics point, you know, a catch-all phrase. So you have to be, again, careful about, well, what do you mean by ESG? What is the role within ESG? You know, it doesn't mean you're necessarily going to be doing financial, you know, analysis or investing. Some companies care about ESG because they want to be seen to the investors as being a good investment, right? So there's different sides of this. Um, so just be careful with the use of that you know, ESG term, I think it's somewhat replacing the word sustainability um, in the market, just like corporate social responsibility is now representing a little bit more the social impact side of things. So again, this stuff just changes constantly and you've got to stay aligned with whoever your audience and target's going to be on how they talk about this. The other couple of things that I've seen um, increasing is diversity, equity, and inclusion. So that is definitely part of the impact space because of our, we, we look at things basically about community, environment, marketplace, and workplace. Those are kind of the four quadrants of the impact world. And so, you know, marketplace would be your consumers, let's say, or your suppliers. Uh, workplace is your internal employees and people, right? And so that's where DEI sits in. And you'll see a lot of roles now as a hybrid between DEI and, and CSR or CR or sustainability. Usually DEI sits within human resources, but it's starting to, you know, depending again on the company, sit in, in our more impact space. Circular economy, that's another obviously key word. Again, that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So decide what that means to you. What does it mean to your audience and how are you gonna drill into that? One area that sits under that is technology. How is technology going to allow us to be more circular in how we approach um, a product or a service? And then things like plastics. So there's lots of things that under, are, again, underneath circular economy. So don't assume that that language is all going to be you know, enough to sell to your audience because you need to define it more again. And then the last one is, so that's ESG, DEI, circular economy. And the other one is social impact and human rights. So there's a lot more. Um, happening now within social impact. And that doesn't necessarily just mean charity partnerships or, you know, the, the for-profit, non-profit um, inter interplay. I think these issues are becoming um, broader, everything from, so, you know, social justice to racial equality. All of this is getting now, again, kind of channeled into what we're now terming social impact. So there's so much opportunity, as you can see. And in terms of the jobs coming into the market, um, yes, of course, there's a slowdown a little bit with COVID in certain industries, but other industries are making up for that, right? So we're seeing a lot of movement in the tech sector. We're seeing a lot of movement in the financial sector um, with actual tangible jobs in this space. So don't think, oh, we're in a financial downturn or an economic downturn or COVID's throwing everything off. It really hasn't. It's just, you might be targeting different sectors than you had done before. Um, and certain sectors like retail and apparel, for instance, they're not going away, right? They're challenged right now. So they might not have the jobs as, as many jobs open, but they're not gonna go away. And so we still need to, we still need people like us in there helping them to become more sustainable in times of downturn, right? So. Lots of opportunity. I'd say, you know, COVID is only going to be helping us in some ways because it's raising awareness of a lot of these issues. 
Um, and again, that interplay with the financial markets is, is really a big game changer for us. Yeah, super interesting. And I think what I'm hearing is, you know, a lot of these companies now, they need to become more resilient. I think that's what they're realizing through all of this. And if we as job seekers can market as people who can help them to become more resilient because of our skill set, because we are more agile in the ways that we work or whatever our background happens to be, however you want to market yourself towards that direction, I think could be um, really advantageous now as uh, our ways of working are changing, but um, companies are looking to see should or if this happens again, how do we make sure that um, yeah, our business is indeed sustainable. So I think that's a really interesting point. Um, so a couple of questions in the chat box. Um, one from uh, Pierre says, what about entrepreneurship or building your own job? What is uh, Shannon's take on this? Thanks. Great question. Um, so I have a tool called a job proposal uh, tool that I help clients build out for exactly that because I, we're seeing more and more that the job boards applying to job doesn't actually increase your chances that much. What we need to be doing is being more creative as job seekers to say, I wanna work for these 10 organizations. I'm gonna use my networks and human contacts and talking to people to start opening up conversations to see what are the needs of those companies I wanna target. And then almost retrofitting yourself into the organization. And that could be through doing a pro bono project, um, doing a bit of research for them, whatever, so that you can just get in there just a little bit in order to then create your own role. So this is becoming more and more common and more and more effective as a strategy. And why is because oftentimes organizations don't even know what they need until it presents itself, right? So if you're a good fit for the organization, you come in with an innovative cutting edge idea that's going to have a good business case behind it, they will want to talk to you, right? So it's also putting yourself on the front foot rather than the back foot as a job seeker, right? You're going out and saying, I've got ideas, I've got skills, I can return value, here's how rather than saying, oh, I've got to force myself and prove, you know, that I can do the tick, tick, tick of what you put into a job description. So it's a very different mindset and approach. Um, and it is usually for people that have that confidence about their own abilities and their own ideas and are probably entrepreneurial in nature. Now, the word entrepreneurial, you have to be a little bit careful with um, in that if you want to be an entrepreneur and start your own thing, that's fine. Um, then you call yourself an entrepreneur if that's what fits for you. Social entrepreneurship is extremely popular and huge in this space now, of creating a social enterprise that is a for-profit organization serving a or solving really a need of society while investing back their profits into the organization, right? So it's a, an interesting hybrid um, structure that's really fascinating. And you can often get government funding to help you launch something like that. So if you have an entrepreneurial mindset and want to work for yourself, you could go down a route like that. But if you're entrepreneurial and want to work for someone else, you're going to want to use language like intrapreneurial. So there's a whole movement around intrapreneurs. And if you Google it, you'll see there's a league of entrepreneurs and there's an entrepreneur lab. And I work a lot in this space, which is basically around um, really enabling and encouraging and empowering people within organizations that have that drive like an entrepreneur does, but to use that drive to create and innovate new ideas within an organization rather than starting your own separate organization. So hopefully that answers your question. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, the questions are flying in. So I'm just gonna go straight back to the chat box. Um, hi, Shannon and Kathy. Most of these roles are becoming highly specialized in new, so no internal capacity to train on the topic and requiring someone with plug and play capabilities. How to effectively convey the ability to join and start running without concrete experience? I'm not sure I understand the question. It sounds like... Where is um, this? Oh, there it is. I see it now. Yeah. Most of these roles are becoming highly specialized in new, so internal capacity to train on the topic 
plus requiring someone to play composed. I can also jump in and uh, uh, elaborate for you. Can you guys okay. hear me? Sure. Yeah. So, so what I what I notice is that, um, especially small institutions that want to take a step in this direction, just simply don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. So they start uh, the, when they start looking for someone. They say we want someone that knows everything that can just run with it. But but because there are so many uh, new topics here, not everyone can run with it. Uh, without some training. So uh, yeah, curious to, to hear your thoughts on that one. So it's basically the question of how do you prove you have the potential to be able to deliver what they're hiring for? Yeah, that is exactly it, yes. Okay, um, without concrete experience. So the number one thing you're gonna need to do then is to translate your previous experience, even if it's just through studies or volunteering or whatever it is, um, you're going to need to translate that experience for what it is they're looking to, to buy, so to speak. So you can't just go in and be like, I have no experience, but I look at me, I have such potential because there's going to be someone else that has the experience, right? So what you've got to do is be able to translate some of the nuggets of what you've already done in your life. And it doesn't necessarily have to be paid work experience. Okay. So you can get creative again about pro bono projects consulting projects while you were at, at uni or at master's programs, um, volunteer leadership that you've done. It doesn't all have to be paid work experience. But again, you've got to do that mapping and that groundwork around translating all of the nuggets that you think are relevant to what they're looking for. So you've got to do the work around telling your story so that it's easy for the reader, the hiring manager, the recruiter to see that even though you don't have the exact cookie cutter, you know, exact same experience that maybe, you know, where they are or what they thought they were looking for, well, wow, you've got something transferable and that's enough for us. So that's the, that's the art of this process. And that's basically what, what I built my course around is helping people do just that. Yeah, that's great. I completely agree. I mean, if, a recruiter or hiring manager has to make the connections themselves, they won't. <laughs> so you have to make it easy for them. I think uh, that's really what it comes down to. Spot on. That's exactly it. Do the groundwork for the reader. Don't make them have to mix and match and figure it out. Yep. Yeah. So, so question from uh, Wolfrin. Uh, question to Shannon tagging onto her ESG remarks. Which candidate market does her offer focus on, if any? I noticed that US and Europe embrace ESG integration at different paces and ways. Did you want um, Wolfrin to uh, elaborate yeah. on that? Yes, please, Wolfrin. What, what is the question exactly then? I need to unmute Wolfram wherever you are. Yes, I'm unmuted. Hello, good afternoon. Hi. Or, yeah. Um, well, with with responsibility uh, oriented investing, I've noticed that the US is, um, yeah, now full on. Uh, you referred to the BlackRock example, but um, those developments have taken place a little bit earlier in, in Europe. And we see that they have already leveled up to higher ways of integration with engagement and active dialogues with with uh, companies. So I'm just more wondering if what you refer to is more an example of the US or if what you do personally as a coach uh, doesn't really matter on which region your candidate comes from or which uh, area okay. is. I work. My candidates are global. I sit in Europe. I've been in Europe 20 years. I'm American, so I, I straddle the, the pond and I've got clients in Asia as well. So I keep you know, my finger on the pulse across the world. Um, but I think you're right, absolutely, that Europe is always a bit ahead of the US on these issues. Um, another reason Brexit is quite depressing, um, but for us in the UK. Um, so yes, I think you're right. There's a lot actually in Amsterdam even around um, impact investing that's been around for years, right? 10 years of, of uh, a whole movement around impact investing out of Amsterdam. And so again, you could call that part of ESG or you could call that sustainable investing. You know, there's all different ways to look at this. 
So I don't think there's one quick answer to that, Wolfram, other than to say, wherever you are as a, as a job seeker, whatever market you're looking at, so let's say it's in the Netherlands or it's across Europe or it's in the US, you need to know that market, right? So you don't need to worry about the other markets, really. I mean, the trends that we're seeing though, because the US financial market is so globally impactful on all of us, this shift for the US is going to affect all of us, right? Regardless of whether or not Europe was ahead of the game. So I think that's maybe, does that answer your question? Yes, you do. Thank you very much for elaborating. Sure. And uh, Shannon, I'm getting a couple of questions. Maybe you can uh, let people know how they can learn more about the tools that you've uh, spoken about. Yeah, sure. I'm happy to, I'll pop my my link to my, my website course into the chat. Yeah, and if you, anyone wants to do any further work with me, um, I'm happy to offer all attendees from today a 10% discount on whatever you're seeing on my website. So feel free to um, email me and I will make sure we'll have to do it offline because you can't book it over the website with a discount, but happy to honor that to all you net impactors. Um, but I'll send you the, I'll put the link in for you now. Thank you. Okay, so I see three three more questions we'll try and get through. I think this one is a bit uh, similar, whoops, to what you've touched on before, which was um, from Lena. She says, hi, Shannon, my question is once you already get familiar, with the semantics of the sector you want, uh, how do you differentiate yourself if everyone is saying the same or using the same semantics, uh, especially when you do not have previous experience? And I think this maybe goes back to what you were talking about, um, going beyond just applying online all the time and maybe doing a bit of hidden job market as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I maybe could elaborate. Yeah, sure, Lena. Why don't you tell me what where this is coming from for you? Yeah, so this is just like uh, if you could. Um, so, so, so I understood what you said about like learning the semantics of the sector is actually something that it, um, I have learned uh, by mistake this year, like by doing a lot of applications and at the end and uh, not getting any answer because I wasn't using the right uh, semantics. Oh. But the start doing it like like you start reading a lot like understanding the semantics then I got this um um I'm afraid that I'm just gonna sound exactly the same as everyone else who's applying for for this sector uh so I don't know how to di differentiate myself now from from that okay so I think it's probably two separate things Lena I think the semantics we want to be resonating for that audience however you've got to do the groundwork about what are your differentiators before you're doing applications. So for instance, if we built you, you know, a CV and a LinkedIn profile around what you think your target is, you would, that would be what I would call kind of a template that would work most of the time. But you're then going to go in and customize that 20%, up to 20% for each application, right? So let's say one organization is calling it sustainability and another organization is calling it sustainable business you want to match their language because you may end up going into an ATS system, an automatic an, a, a applicant tracking system, and we want the keywords to resonate for them. So on the application side, it's really important that you match your semantics. On your more general template offering of how do you differentiate yourself, um, which then ends up on LinkedIn, and LinkedIn doesn't change for each application, that is your brand, no matter what. And that's what we as recruiters will look at, no matter what, even if we get an application. That story needs to come out around what is, Le who is Lena, right? Who is Lena and how is Lena different or offering something of more value than we even know we want? So you've got to do the personal branding work to develop that, A, understanding of yourself, and B, translate that then for your market and C, then put that out there in a way that's gonna resonate from a semantics perspective. Thank you, yeah, great. Yeah, so it's a little bit about that translating again, when you don't have previous experience, it's still about that translating what have you done that is relevant and is transferable. 
brilliant. Thank you. Our next question is from uh, Saloni. I see her online. Uh, you have, she says, you have a very interesting and helpful overview. I have a finance background and a master's degree in sustainability. I want to work in impact investing, preference in food and agriculture. My question is, how can I tap into the hidden job network and connect with people in the industry better? Great question, Saloni. Thank you. I couldn't have like plugged that question any better. <laughs> so first of all, well done getting your master's. Second of all, well done knowing what you want to do, impact investing, food and ag. You're really narrowing it down, which is fantastic because what that allows people in your network to do when you reach out to them and ask for help is I could go into my LinkedIn profile and go, okay, impact investing is my keyword. Look at all my first connections. I could do impact investing food and look at the intersection of those two and all my first connections. You know, it's so much easier for those of us that have big networks to help you if you're specific. So that's another argument for being specific. So great that you know that much. Now, the question being about the hidden job market. So the hidden job market, for those of you that don't understand that, what that means is basically the fact that about 50% of roles are never even posted to job boards. Okay, so they are hidden. We don't even know about them if we're only using job boards as our main strategy for finding roles. And what this tells us is that if we're spending, let's say we have 100% of our time on our job search, so whatever our, our job search time is, 80% of that time needs to be spent on making human connections with people, right? This is a people agenda anyway. So from a recruiter perspective, we wanna know you can connect. We don't wanna just think you're just hiding behind an email or hiding behind an ATS system. We want to know that you can build relationships and that you're confident enough to reach out and make a human connection. So 80% of your job seeker time should actually be making a human connection with someone. 20% of your time invested in this process is on job boards, okay? That will greatly shift your ability to unpack, to leverage your network, to grow your network and to unpack and find these hidden jobs. Okay, so how do you connect? So that's how you tap into the hidden job network is you basically need to have everyone you've ever known know what you're looking for and stay on their radar. So you might have, I have a, something, a tool called Networking Opportunity Map where we actually look at all of our, so you would go in, let's say Saloni, you'd go into your LinkedIn and you'd say, who do I know that's an impact investing in food and ag and the location I'm looking to work in? And you'd map those people, right? And then you'd come up with a strategy for how to reach out to them, when to reach out, what have you sent to them? What does the email need to say? How well do you know them? You start to kind of almost build like a whole profiling of your own network that's relevant. And then there's another level, which is of those people that you already know, who do they know? And how can you make it easy for them to put you in touch with someone else that extends your, your network, all right? And that's another layer to building on this kind of networking process um, that I take you through. So I think um, an overarching bit of advice on that one is don't be afraid of people. We're all just people at the end of the day and we wanna connect. Um, if you come to us in this, if, as recruiters and people with big networks in the space, if you come to us, not knowing what you want, not being clear about how we can help and looking needy and insecure, you're not gonna get results. But if you come to us knowing what you want, asking a specific question or a specific ask for help and being confident that what you're offering to the market is of value, then you're gonna get the traction. I'll leave it there. Thank you, that was, that was very helpful, thank you. Yeah, that was brilliant. I just want to touch on that last point too, because I think it was super important how you mentioned the difference between reaching out to someone um, as a networking opportunity and then speaking with a recruiter or someone with like in HR and that with a recruiter, you have to know what you want um, as opposed to if you are having an informational interview, or just having a chat with somebody who works in a company of interest and you're curious about what they do and you want to kind of build that relationship, then you can be a bit more 
vulnerable in terms of saying, uh, I haven't quite narrowed everything down yet, but I'm curious about your experiences. I, I think that's kind of a difference that if you speak to someone, uh, a recruiter can't help you, they're not uh, a career coach. So if you speak to a recruiter, you have to be very confident about um, your direction and uh, the position that you want, as opposed to maybe when you're speaking with other people in kind of a networking uh, situation. Yes and no, Kathy. I would just love to add to that in that sure. I would say that every single conversation you're all going to have from this moment forward is an interview. Every single conversation. So whether or not you're trying to get information and part of your research about figuring out what you want to do next, or you're actually applying to a live role, it's the same. You mm -hmm. still have to have your elevator pitch ready. You still have to know what you're wanting. You still have to know what your interest areas are. Absolutely. If, yeah, so I'd be careful with the concept of informational interviews and you know, exploratory chats about someone's career. Um, people don't honestly have time for that anymore. To, uh, you know, you might find a few people that are open and willing to help and mentor you, but I would say every conversation you're going to have from this call forward is an interview. Great perspective. Thanks, Shannon. Uh, another question from Andrea, any tips for one in a dream for one in a dream sustainability role, how to grow your persuasion and leadership skills to bring others along with you? Great question. So that is probably a little bit outside the context for today, um, I would say. I'm not sure that's relevant for everyone, except to say that is a skill that every, all of us that are going in-house to in-house roles are gonna need. We're gonna need to know how to influence, persuade, build buy-in, um, and, and herd the cats, we kind of say, you know, get people on the journey with us. So I would say I'm not comfortable in, that's a whole nother workshop in a way, talking about that skill set. And I do that a lot in my executive coaching and my communications coaching work. However, what I would say that on the back of that is those are skills that are absolutely crucial for you to sell to your audience, no matter what kind of role you're going into. You need to be able to position yourself as one of your key skills that you can build relationships, you can build the business case, you can gain the buy-in, you can enable and empower others that's not their day job to go on this journey with you. You're empathetic. You can actually build the momentum and a movement within an organization because you've got the emotional intelligence skills and the communication skills that are gonna allow that to happen. So I love the question. I think it's another workshop, so I don't wanna cop out on the answer, the full answer, but I would say, definitely be playing that up as one of your skill sets and be putting it on your professional development radar. Brilliant, thank you. And I think I'll take one more question from the chat box here from Rebecca. Um, she says, many people called to work in sustainability do it for a purpose bigger than themselves and are not always comfortable in the spotlight. Yet career development and opportunities these days are heavily dependent on being visible online. Any concrete tips for service-driven introvert types on how to be visible in a way that feels authentic and adds value? Oh, that's a beautiful question. I love that because you're absolutely right. In fact, most of us don't like self-promoting. <laughs> and unfortunately, this whole process is about self-promoting and it's very tiresome for many of us and uncomfortable for many of us. Um, so I don't really think there's a workaround to be quite honest, other than to say, um, you need to be true to yourself, right? Because if you misrepresent yourself in the market in any way, then you're going to get into a job that might not be the right role, or you're going to get into a culture that might not be the right fit for you. So I would always lead your personal branding messaging with an authentic voice of what matters to you, what's important to you, where do you see yourself adding the value? Um, it doesn't mean we all have to be extroverts out there, you know, building massive stakeholder alliances. There's plenty of roles that don't require that kind of extroverted energy and, um, and you know, propensity. So uh, I would just say that, stay true to yourself because the minute we start to try to be someone else, we're gonna not have that alignment internally and we're not gonna be in our own equilibrium. So, 
um, yeah, I'll leave it there, but, um, you know, do some work maybe with yourself around what really matters and who are you and what are your values and um, what kind of culture would fit you best. And then you might just need to reconcile the fact that we do have to have an online presence now. It's just the nature of our world. As much as we all want to fight it, I fight my kids every day about video games, trust me. Um, you know, there's not much we can do. We've got to, somewhat of these things we've got to just embrace. So I'll leave it there. <laughs> yeah, that was a great point. Thank you, Shannon. And uh, we're almost at the top of the hour. So uh, perhaps just to close, is there any final remarks that you would like to give to everyone online? Uh, I know we spoke previously that uh, you would like to send everyone an email with further information about uh, what you do. And so I would like to just say that here. Uh, to let everybody know um, any kind of final tips, um, final uh, words of wisdom <laughs> for everyone as they uh, embark on their uh, career journey. Yeah, I think, um, well, I always say, you know, I've, again, I've worked with actually more than a thousand coaches now over the years in this space and recruited even more. So I know that whatever you're setting out to do is possible. Okay. So what it boils down to is your approach, your process, your own ability to believe in yourself and your conviction that you can make this happen and you will make this happen. I, I, I guarantee you, it might not be a straight line and it might get you down some pigeon, you know, some, some rabbit holes and you might have to shift. But if you are resilient and agile about your own career and your own abilities, you will be able to find roles and, and, and organizations where you are aligned and you feel purpose and you get out of bed every morning excited to go to work. So I promise you that, but you've got to do the groundwork. You've got to break down the process. You've got to do the strategic steps. Um, and if you are having insecurity or lack of confidence, you might need to do the deeper work about, you know, who you are and get that support so that you can come out with a big, you know, with an energy of, of confidence as you go out to your market and to your audiences. So best of luck to all of you. Please reach out if you um, want to ask more questions. Happy to, to field some of those. If you would like to join me on LinkedIn, I've got Walk of Life Coaching as a group. Um, I also post a lot on my page. We have, um, I post hot jobs on there every day and you're welcome to go on my insights page of my website, which has like 10 years of content. You can type in any keyword that you're curious about into the search button on my website and find those articles. Um, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn and be happy to connect, but always tell me who you are and why we're connecting and how we've met. Um, we do that with everyone and that you're, that you're reaching out to and um, best of luck, best of luck. We need you out there making a difference. So keep it going. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shannon. Super, super inspiring and so much amazing information in there for everybody. Uh, you're such an expert on this topic. That, um, I feel very grateful that we've had this opportunity to chat and um, share what you know with our members. I think um, it's really special. And uh, I just, as I mentioned at the top of the hour, I just wanted to take a couple minutes to mention that Net Impact Amsterdam is going to be launching a mentor program. And um, I'm going to share two super quick slides about it because I, I knew I would forget everything if I tried to do it uh, ad lib, um, which I'll just do now. So this will be happening very soon. Um, essentially, members can submit an application we're going to match you with a mentor. And then with that mentor, you'll be able to agree on the scope of your mentoring uh, partnership and applications are going to be open soon and they're going to close on December 5th. And then um, it was going to start early in 2021. So you'll know kind of end of December, whether or not you've been accepted into the program, we'll be keeping it quite small. Uh, the first time around, this is the first time that we're doing this type of a program. And then uh, we'll kick off at the start of January. So super exciting for us to start this kind of mentoring program journey. And I think Shannon, your talk um, was a great way to start it off uh, learning from an expert uh, in the field as you are. 
So with that, I'm going to close the session. And um, as Shannon said, you can reach out to her on LinkedIn or you check her out at Waku. Oh, quick sorry. Question. Sorry, Kathy, I just got a text that someone can't connect with me without my email. So I'm going to put my email into the chat so that you can connect with me on LinkedIn as well. And you can email me if you need to. Um, and Kathy, do you mind just saving the chat for me? Because if I didn't answer all the questions, I'm happy to get around to people separately. Of course, not a problem. Great. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. And take care. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for joining us.